All right, the part of the chapter that we're going to be focusing on this evening in Mark chapter 10 is starting there in verse number 17, where the Bible reads, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So this guy comes up to Jesus. This is kind of a famous story. Um, and he comes running up to him and he's, you know, he's saying, Good master, you know, what must I do? What do I need to do in order to inherit eternal life. Now the answer that Jesus gives them is pretty interesting. And there's a lot to be learned here because normally what we would think, if someone were to come up to you and ask you, you know, like, what must I do to be saved? We're going to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's what they said in Acts 16. And, um, but that's not the answer that Jesus gave them. So let's take a look at this, uh, verse number 18. He starts right off the bat saying, and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And I'm not going to do an entire sermon just on this one story, although it's really interesting and we could. And I'm going to give a little bit of an explanation of why Jesus answers him the way he does, because there are certain things that we have to believe or understand in order to, to be saved, in order to put our faith in Christ. For example, we need to have the right Jesus. If we're going to get saved by somebody named Jesus, it needs to be the Jesus of the Bible, and, and legitimately that Jesus. And um, one of the things that we believe about Christ is that he was God in the flesh. Jesus was a deity. Jesus Christ was a God-man. He was 100% human, but 100% God at the same time. He's part of the Trinity, the triune Godhead. Um, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5. And this is an excellent verse to use when you have someone that, that doesn't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. You know, a Jehovah's Witness, for example, or a Mormon. Neither one of those cults believe that Jesus Christ was a deity. They don't believe that he was God in the flesh. They just, they just say that, well, he's a son of God. He's a son of God. And, and they'll try to just get you to stop when they, just by saying that. Oh, well, I believe he's the son of God. No, 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 no. Do you believe he is God? He's God in the flesh. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And what Jesus is asking him here is, well, wait a minute. You just called me good because he said good master. He's saying, why are you calling me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. Now, we have to understand when Jesus makes that statement, that is a true statement. There is none good but one, and that is God. So but the next question then is to the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, was Jesus good? Was he good? Because Jesus said right here, hey, well, why are you calling me good? Now, if someone were to ask you or ask me, are you good? And in light of the Bible, in context of the Bible, I would have to say no. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. We are all sinners. We have, we have all broken God's law and his commandments. And by doing so, that makes us no longer good. Right? In order to be good, especially the way that he's using this word here, I mean, you'd have to be completely perfect and sinless. And that is what Jesus was, which is why he is good and he is God. So when he asks the question, he didn't say, I'm not good. He just said, well, why are you calling me good? And that would lead me to think that that guy didn't believe that he was God in the flesh. So he's saying, well, why are you calling me good? You know, you could have a lot, and you know, and the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, they'll say they believe in Jesus. But if they don't believe in the deity Jesus, if they don't believe in the Godhead Jesus, then they've got the wrong Jesus. They've got some other Jesus that they've invented, that they've created to fit their, their doctrine or to fit their belief that is not found in Scripture. Right. And there's so many places in Scripture we can go to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. And I've done that in past sermons. You can look at Hebrews 1.8, But under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Talking to the Son and saying, Thy throne, O God. The Son is God. And on and on. You know, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Right? And you could, you could literally go on for a really long time. I preach an entire sermon just on the deity of Christ. This is a great example here in Mark chapter 10. Well, why are you calling me good? 
There's none good but one, and that's God. But he continues on here now. He answers this question because he first it's right off the bat, and he's saying, look, you got you to gotta understand who I am. There is none good but God, and, and he was God. But then he continues his answer, though, his response, verse 19. Thou knowest the commandments. See, whereas we might answer them with, you just got to believe, right, and, and go into everything about Christ and everything else. He says, well, you know the commandments, right? Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he goes through basically half of the Ten Commandments right there. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now, I'm not a better soul winner than Jesus Christ. I don't know a better way to handle something than he does. So when I say, well, we might answer, you know, if someone asks you that question, this way, right? Jesus didn't answer that way. He knows more and he's better. So don't get the wrong impression of what I'm saying here because I'm not saying that, that I know better than Christ and that my response would be any better. No. He knew what he was doing. But see, what he was doing here, what I believe he's doing here, is demonstrating something to this person because Jesus had a lot more insight into people. I mean, there are times where the Bible says that he knew people's thoughts. Okay, he, he was really intuitive and he was able to understand a lot more about people than, than we could understand. But even when we go through the plan of salvation with someone, one of the first things that we do is make sure that they understand that they are a sinner that there is a penalty and a judgment that they deserve to pay, to pay for. And see, what he did with this person, he starts off with the commandments, which oftentimes I do too, one way or another. You know, we start off in Romans 3, 23, saying, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's kind of explained, look, you're a sinner. And then explain the punishment for their sin is being held. Because the majority of people, they may agree, oh yeah, I've sinned, I've done some things wrong, but I don't believe I deserve hell. Now look, if someone doesn't believe from Scripture that they deserve this punishment of hell, then what in the world are they going to need a Savior for? Why do they need someone to save them? They don't. They're thinking they're just fine, that everything's just well with the, based on their own works. And Jesus doesn't have to go any farther with this person. If someone doesn't realize that they're in trouble, what's the point of even telling them how to be saved when they don't even realize they need a Savior? That's, 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 you know, a step beyond where they're at. So he tells them, the, oh, basically he's saying commandments, he's saying, look, I've observed all of these from my youth. Now, do you think he's telling the truth? The commandments, he said, do not commit adultery. Okay, maybe he hasn't committed adultery. Do not kill. Yeah, okay, maybe he hasn't killed either, right? Not everyone commits adultery or kills. This says, do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Hey, bearing a false witness means you lied. You mean to tell me that this guy is, has never borne false witness from his youth? I mean, he didn't say, I haven't done anything wrong in the past year. You know, he's, he's like, well, from my youth, I've never, I haven't told a lie. I've never borne, borne false witness. I can't say that. <laughs> you know, if I were to say that now, I'd be lying to you. And see, he couldn't say that either. He did say it because he was self-righteous. But... There is no way that he has kept the law all the way from his youth. Otherwise, he'd be Jesus. And Jesus answered him then and said, Okay, well, one thing you lack then. Go, go thy way, sell all your possessions, give them to the poor. He says, Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. Right? Because that's what Jesus did. From his youth, Jesus Christ never sinned. From his youth, Jesus did keep all the commandments. And he's like, Oh, okay. So you're just like me then. Well, you know, and he knew this guy was rich that came to him. He was, a, he was a rich young ruler that came to him. He says, okay, yeah, sell all your stuff. Like I, you know, like he was, Jesus Christ was walking around homeless, teaching and doing everything. Take up the cross and follow me. If you, I mean, because why not then? Why not? If, if he's perfect, he might as well die for the sins of the world, right? But of course he wasn't. It says that he was sad at that saying, went away grieved for he had great possessions. He had a lot of stuff. He didn't want to see parting with it. He, that, was, that was too close to his heart. 
And, and think about how sad that is and how pathetic that is for someone that comes, and I think it's in another gospel, he falls down on his knees and he says, good master, you know, what would I have to do? What is it to inherit eternal life? Now think about that. He asks the very question. He wants to get eternal life. Life that lasts forever. Something that he must have been thinking about. Something that he must have pondered for a little bit more than just someone approaching him on the street and just asking him a question point blank, kind of catching by surprise. He sought out Jesus. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He cared more about his worldly possessions than he cared about eternal life. That's insane to me. No amount of money on this earth that you can possess is ever going to be worth living forever, not going to hell. I mean, how could you put a, a price tag on it? But apparently, it was too cheap for him. He didn't have respect unto the, unto the reward. And he went away unsaved. And it says in verse 23, And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. They're like, What in the world? What do you mean? But Jesus answereth again. He clarifies it and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? And that's the truth. People who love their goods, they love too much the things that they possess and it ends up possessing them. And they can't just forsake it and say, I don't need any of this stuff and, and realize that they need a savior. See, when people have a lot of goods and a lot of wealth, they have a tendency to be very proud also. It goes along with it. You start, people, people have a lot of money and look, we've, we've experienced this, probably everybody has seen this, especially if you don't have a lot of money, you're someone who's, who's maybe relatively poor, and then you come into contact with someone who has a whole bunch of money, oftentimes they look at people that are poor as if they don't even exist or as if they're subhuman or as, they're, as if they're just way better than them. Their time is so much more important. They're so, you know, everything about them is, is better than anyone else around them. And this just is, is the money that goes to people's heads. Now, not every single person is like that, but it is, it is uh, something that happens very, very frequently. And the people that, especially when people make their own riches and they work their own way and they work real hard for it, there's a sense of pride there that they achieve because they think, look at all this stuff that I have done. I did this. I did that. I overcame all the obstacles. I did everything that I need to survive. And now I've amassed all this stuff through my own hard work without ever recognizing anything from the Lord or anything from anyone else. Just, I did all this. They don't have that much of a need for anything else. They say, I've got it covered. It might not be easy, but it might be difficult, but I could do it. I might, not, you know, I might not be the perfect person, but I could live good enough to get to heaven. I mean, that's the way those type of people will think. And if you're trusting in your riches and you're trusting in yourself, ultimately, can't make it to heaven. Now, um, this is real interesting, though, because everything that Jesus said in this example here in Mark 10 is true. There is essentially two ways into heaven. And he talks to him here because he asked, he asked about um, you know, inheriting eternal life. And he says, well, you know the commandments. And that is one way to get into heaven. If you're born and you live a perfect life and you never commit any sin and you do everything right and you do all that you're supposed to do, you do everything perfect, You'll make it in heaven. There's no reason that God will not allow you into heaven if you do everything right. So there is definitely one way to get into heaven. The problem is nobody can do that. Jesus Christ was the only one that was able to do that. And the Bible says in many places, you know, entrance into heaven is only for the righteous. So in Revelation 21.8, we use this commonly out soul winning. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and uh, sorcerers and, or, and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All of those things, all of those sins will keep people out of heaven. It says you all deserve this punishment of hell. Anyone who's done any of these things. Why? Because you have to be righteous in order to enter into heaven. Revelation 21, 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, talking about heaven, talking about the kingdom of God. 
Then there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. He's saying no one's allowed into this place that defiles, that works abomination, things that God hates, or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Meaning that if your name is in the Lamb's book of life, then you do not work abomination and you have not made a lie. You say, well, how is that possible? How has that happened? How could that be? Because I have lied before, but I know that my name's in the Lamb's book of life. Because once you're washed in the blood of Christ, once you're made righteous, all of those sins are purged and you are, you are a new creature. And it's the new man doesn't have sin, it doesn't sin. 1 John chapter 3 explains that. Which is why you can be looked upon as not having any of those things. But without Christ, then you're going to be judged according to your works. You're going to be looked at as, well, yes, you have done these things. You haven't been absolved of those things. You haven't been forgiven or pardoned for the sins that you've done. They haven't been washed away and paid for. Your debt is not um, in paid, you know, fully paid yet. Galatians 5, verse 19. You don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Or actually, you know what? Turn to James 2. I'm sorry. I'm going to kind of skip through this real, real quickly. This, my point here on entrance in the kingdom being for the righteous. Galatians 5, uh, 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's what we saw in Revelation 21, and it's what we're going to see here in Ephesians 5. Verse 5 says, For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So, obviously, all, there's so many different sins. It's more than just a list in Revelation 21.8 that will keep us from being saved. And, um, you know, trying to keep the whole law. And is there, are you in James chapter 2? There's so many points where we could fail. There's so many areas where we can fall short, right? There's so many areas that we could be guilty of. And James 2 explains that if you're trying to keep the whole law for your righteousness, if you're trying to get to make it to heaven that way, because I said there's two ways to heaven. One is by just being righteous and doing everything right. As soon as you sin, you're guilty. As soon as you felt falter in one place, as soon as you tell that one lie, as soon as you do anything, you're guilty. Verse number 8 of James chapter 2 says, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture... Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law. So if anyone, you keep the entire law of God, all of his commandments. He says, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he's guilty of all. So all of a sudden you're guilty. You're guilty of being a criminal. You're guilty of transgressing God's law. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Any one sin is enough to, to send a person to hell. And that's it. And you are no longer um, allowed to go to heaven. You are no longer righteous. Your righteousness becomes as filthy rags the moment you commit your first sin. Which is why obedience to the law for righteousness does not work. We can't do it. The only person who's ever been able to do that is the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who was without sin. And that's why we can say that he was good. As I mentioned earlier, you know, he is the one that, it, that the Bible explicitly says was without sin. The Bible says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth in um, 1 Peter chapter 2. Which again, write that down if you don't have that as one of your soul winning notes for explaining to people that don't believe in the deity of Christ, saying, well, he was sinless. There's none good but one, and that's God. And if someone's without sin, I think I could call that person good. 
There's no reason that they're not good because they haven't done anything bad because they haven't sinned. And that's how you can prove that there uh, through using even the words out of Jesus' own mouth. 1 Corinthians 6. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. We're going to spend a little bit of time in there. Romans chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 reads, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And this is the key, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So you see, he lists off a bunch of sins. He's saying, look, there's all these sins, right? And these are just some of them. And some of you have done those things. And he says, anyone who does these things, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You've done any of these things, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he answers, say, you know, well, hey, but some of you guys did these things. But the key is you've been washed. You have been sanctified. You've been justified through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's blood has washed you and purged you of your sins. So it's as if you didn't even do those things. And that is the amazing forgiveness that God provides for us. That it's almost like you didn't even do it to begin with. Obviously, we can't make it into heaven by doing everything ourselves perfectly. So the other, only other way is through a Savior. We need to have a Savior that did everything for us. And I know this has kind of been a really long introduction, but the, the, what I'm really going to focus on in the sermon tonight is the righteousness of Jesus. The righteousness of Jesus Christ and just kind of, um, and, and this is a relatively basic, fundamental topic that I'm preaching over tonight. But just take note, maybe there's a couple verses here that, um, that you can use when you're discussing what Jesus did for us. Because it's important to understand that not only did Jesus Christ live a sinless life, He also lived the right life, doing the right thing. So there's a positive and a negative aspect. He didn't do any of the negatives. Right? He didn't go out and commit adultery. He didn't go out and steal. He didn't go out and do things He wasn't supposed to do. But that is not the totality of the law. Because it's not just enough to not do certain things. You also have to do certain things. There are also things that you are supposed to be doing. And Jesus Christ did every single one of those things for us. And not only are the things that we've done that, that have, have been sinful, been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we've been washed by those things, but we also have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed unto us. So all the good things that Jesus did gets put on our account. Jesus was the, the sacrifice that paid for the sin as well as doing the right things to help to, to get us you know, completely righteous in the eyes of God through Christ. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. Romans 4, I'll tell you this right now. If you want to show people about salvation by grace through faith. Romans 4 is an excellent place to go to. And especially if you're a beginner and you haven't given, gone souling very much, the book of Romans in general, you're not going to go wrong. You go Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 5. If you have a hard time remembering things and you're newer at this, start in Romans 3 with just all of sin. And you go through 3, you got Romans 4 here. We're going to go through a bunch of verses. You got Romans 5, you got Romans 6. Okay, you can give the gospel very completely just by going through those few chapters. If you, you know, if you're having a hard time remembering all the different you know places, and you know, I, I want to use this verse or that verse, just getting started, just do Romans. It's awesome. It's great. You go to Romans 10. I mean, get it nice and simple. You can give a complete, thorough presentation of the gospel just in that one book. But let's look at Romans chapter four which also is a great resource for explaining that salvation has always been by grace through faith, whether it's been the New Testament, Old Testament, anywhere in between. You know, people have always been saved by grace through faith. I'm going to start reading in verse number 1, even though it's on my notes. Romans 4, 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God, showing that Abraham was not justified in God's eyes by his own good works, by his own good deeds, that's not what justified Abraham, not in God's eyes at least. That's why it says not before God. Verse number three, for what said the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So the faith that Abraham ha had was counted as righteousness to him. 
Now, just putting your faith in God, that's not like a whole bunch of righteousness, but God sees that and says, this is righteous. And, and he, he counts it as righteousness. It's not like he did anything. He just, put his, he just believed on him. Right? So, you know, the righteousness normally comes by you obeying the commandments and doing what's right and living a righteous life. But just by putting his faith on God, God counted that faith for righteousness. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Again, the same exact phrase. His faith is counted for righteousness. Look at verse number six. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. In the Psalms, they're saying that, hey, the man that, there's a man that's blessed when God imputes or you know, um, imparts unto you, counts unto you, gives you righteousness without doing any of the work yourself. God says, this is, you're righteous. And it has nothing to do with how good you lived. It has to do with how good Jesus lived. And that gets put on your account because you've accepted him, because you put your faith on him. Verse number seven, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Jump down to verse number 11. It says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And then jump down to verse number 22. It says, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Well, verse number 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. So being persuaded, it's this belief. All throughout Romans chapter 4, the belief is imputed for righteousness. The belief on God, believing on Jesus Christ, gets you righteousness in the sight of God. Let's keep reading here at the end of Romans 4. Verse 23 says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Because this whole chapter is talking about Abraham. It's not for his sake alone, verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So just as Abraham had all this righteousness imputed unto him just by believing, he says it's not just for him that is written, it's for all of us. It's for, it's for those in the future, it's for those in the New Testament. I mean, Abraham is pretty old in the Old Testament, Right? Before Moses, before the law, Abraham came. Abraham, you know, was the, the, the grandfather, you know, the progenitor of Israel. And after Israel came Moses and then, you know, and, and on and on throughout history. Abraham's pretty early on in, in, in human history after the flood. And he was forgiven. He was imputed righteousness by his faith. Same way it works for us today, thousands of years later. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. The Apostle Paul had a great desire for, for his physical brethren, the physical seed of Abraham, other Israelites of the flesh to get saved. He's constantly, we see in the book of Acts and here in Romans, he has this desire. He, he wants to preach the gospel to him, but he keeps on getting irritated and getting fed up. And he's like, that's it. I've had enough with you. I'm going to the Gentiles now. Even though that's kind of who he was sent to anyways, he still had this heart to, to just want them to get saved and, and just kept thinking, you know, if I could just, just preach it to him this way or that way or whatever, they might get it. And they just kept refusing and rejecting him. And he's, he's explaining a little bit about their mindset here in, in chapter 10, Romans 10, verse number 1. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And he knows this because he was involved with their, with their false religion. He was a Pharisee. He was zealous. He had a, ze a zeal for God, but his wasn't according to knowledge. His was ignorant, and that's why he received forgiveness anyways, because of things that he did when he was attacking the church and persecuting the church. He says he did it ignorantly in unbelief. 
He didn't know any better. He thought he was serving God. He thought he had the right guy. He thought he was doing what was right, and he didn't. I mean, he was still sinning because ignorance isn't an excuse, but he was still able to receive forgiveness because he wasn't one of what the Bible calls a false prophet in the book of Jude or in 2 Peter 2 because he wasn't willfully, he wasn't a wolf in sheep's clothing. He wasn't wicked on the inside and trying to make himself look good on the outside. He was just honestly trying to do what he thought was right in the sight of God ignorantly. And he says there's a lot of people that have this zeal of God that are Israelites. He says, but it's not according to knowledge. Verse number three, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant. He says they don't even realize about God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He's saying that they, they don't get it. They don't understand. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. The righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ is what he's referring to. He says they've gone about to establish their own righteousness. They think that by obeying the commandments and, and keeping the law and doing all of these things that that is going to be good enough for them to get to heaven. That is going to be enough righteousness. He says no. They're not accepting the righteousness of God. Because that's what they really need. And, and what they're really doing is just lowering the bar and lowering the standard on what's acceptable in God's sight. Because they, everyone has sinned. And when you think that your half obedience or partial obedience to the law is going to be good enough, you better think again because God is a just God. He is, he is a God of justice the way that, you know, this is the way it is and that's the way it's going to be. Now, he offered a way out, but it's still not a, um, it doesn't impact his, his judgment or his, his being a judge or a righteous judge because the punishment has been paid, just paid by somebody else. But the Bible says that the Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now, it doesn't say Christ is the end of the law and the law has just been abolished. The Bible says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And I, I've heard people try to say that, oh, we're free in Christ, so the law doesn't matter anymore. That, that was the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament. There is no law. And I, I tried to explain this to a person. I said, well, wait a minute. Can people still sin in the New Testament? Is it even possible? Is sin an option? Can, of course. I mean, doesn't the Bible tell us that, that you know, all these things are sin? Even in the New Testament, it says it's not to sin. Well, the Bible defines sin as transgressing the law. If sin is the transgression of the law, but the law doesn't exist, if the law just was gone, then sin would not exist. Because without the law, there is no sin. Without the law to say, this is right and this is wrong, and if you do wrong, that's a sin. Without that, there, there is no sin. So people want to say, well, there is no law. See, for Christ is the end of the law. And they don't want to continue the rest of the verse. Christ was the end of the law. He finished the law. No, 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 no. He fulfilled many aspects of the law that we don't observe today when it comes to the offering of sacrifices, for example, when it comes to obeying the, the Sabbath day in, in the law, for, as another example. But he didn't abolish you know, God's judgment on thou shalt not kill. He didn't end, thou shalt not steal. He did not end, thou shalt not commit adultery. He was the end of the law for righteousness. Because obeying the law is one way to be righteous in God's eyes. The problem is none of us can do that. We all fall short. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. Which is why we need Christ who did fulfill that. He was the righteous one. And he is the one that our faith needs to be in for righteousness. That's why it says, for Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And again, it's, it's for those that believe. Once your faith is in Christ, again, once your faith is in Christ, doesn't mean the law is gone, but the curse of the law isn't on you anymore because Christ has forgiven you of that. Christ has washed you of those sins. Amen. But it still means, you know, it, it doesn't mean then that, okay, well, what should we do then? Continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And Okay, in Romans 5 and Romans 6, which is where that comes from, Romans 5, let's turn there real quick. 
Romans 5. Verse number 20. Because, I mean, this is, this is two believers. He is, the, the, the audience here is believers. This is not written to unbelievers. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. He said the whole point of the law is so that people could see that they're sinners. That the, that the offense might abound. Because once there's a law, all of a sudden people are saying, oh wow, now you're all transgressors of the law. Without a law, then you could do all these things, but the, you know, there's, there's no punishment there. There's no problem with it because there's no law stating not to do those things. But as soon as the law entered, it says the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. So anytime there's sin, no matter what the sin, God's grace can cover all sin. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, great then. So God's grace just continues to cover sin. That's exactly what just got done saying here in Romans chapter 5. But look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we, who's we? Born again believers, Paul himself included, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he goes on and on. In order for sin to still be in existence for a believer, it could, the law could not have been abolished or just completely put away and just gone. There still is a place for the law. We are free from the curse of the law. We, our sins are nailed to that cross that Jesus was nailed to. And he's paid for those sins. Praise God for that. But just because he did that doesn't mean that as believers we should just go off and just do any kind of sin because it doesn't matter. It's not true because the law still is, has a purpose. The law is still something that we are expected to follow even though we're saved from its curse. Amen. Let's go back to Romans 10. Romans, Romans 10, 4 said, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Again, right? You live by the law? Good. You're going to be blessed by God, everything else. The problem is nobody has ever been able to do that except for Christ. Verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll read for you from Hebrews chapter 4. As I already mentioned earlier in the sermon, I forgot that I had the reference actually in my notes. You know, we know that Jesus Christ was without sin. That's where the righteousness comes from. Part of the righteousness comes from. And, and the actual payment and atoning for our sins is done by someone who had no sin of his own. Jesus Christ was righteous. He didn't deserve a punishment. He didn't deserve this penalty of hell that everybody else deserves, which is the only reason. We try to explain this to, to people at the door oftentimes also, that the reason why somehow you're able to, um, you know, someone else can pay for your sin. Well, wait a minute. I did my sin, so how can, how, how can he pay for my sins? Well, if it were me trying to pay for your sins, it's not going to work. Because I've got my own to pay for. I can't take anyone else's sin. I've got my own eternal punishment that I would have to pay for myself. But Jesus Christ is capable of doing that because he's a perfect substitute for us. He has no sin of his own. So he can take our sins on himself in order to pay that punishment. He didn't deserve the punishment whatsoever, not in any small degree, which is why he's able to be an acceptable substitute where God could say, okay, you deserve nothing wrong whatsoever. You're willing to take this punishment to let that person go free? Okay. 
And that's the way that God works. And that's justice. That is just a just thing to do for someone else to, that's completely innocent to take over that, um, that punishment. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not... And mark these down because some people will question um, Jesus Christ not having sin. It does come up sometimes where people don't realize that or they don't know that. And it's part of who Jesus was. It's part of the deity of Christ. It really is that important. Hebrews 4.15 is a great example that reads, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Very clear verse saying that Jesus Christ had no sin. Just as 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse number 21, reads, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin. Jesus Christ didn't sin. Again, the second place in the Bible, it says that Jesus did zero sins. Did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. I'm just getting to the, to the proof text for the statements I made earlier that not only you know, was Jesus without sin, which we've amply proven here in Hebrews 4 and 1 Peter chapter 2, but he also lived a righteous life. Because we're talking about the righteousness of Jesus today. And, and recognizing how awesome that is that God imputes that righteousness unto us through no work of our own, through no, nothing good that we have done, but through everything that, that Jesus has done. And that getting applied to our account. John chapter 8, look at verse number 28. The Bible reads, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Before we get to verse 29, I just want to make this mention too. In John chapter 8, there's three times that Jesus Christ refers to himself as, I am He. I am He. This is another great place to turn to to prove the deity of Jesus Christ because the people at that time, they wanted to stone Him with stones. Because he made himself equal with God. He said that he was. I mean, you think about when, when God revealed himself unto Moses. What did he say his name was? I am. He said, I am that I am hath sent thee. That's what he said unto Moses. To, he said, well, well, Moses said, well, who should I say he sent me? You're like, like, what's your name, God? Who should I say that, that is, is giving me these commandments? He said, I am. I am hath sent me. And Jesus Christ was on his word. He said, I am he. He said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You are who? Is the, is the, the right question to ask in that? You are who? If you don't believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Jehovah's Witness. If you believe not that, he, that I am he, Mormons, you're going to die in your sins. You have to believe that Jesus Christ was not only the Son of God, but God incarnate. Verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Everything that Jesus did in his life was pleasing to the Father. Jesus always did those things. That are, you know, we screw up. You know, there's sometimes we're like, oh man, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. You know, I, I flaked out on this. There's someone I should have given the gospel to over there and I didn't do it. And I was kind of scared. And I was ashamed. Or I was embarrassed or whatever the, the case may be. We don't always do those things that are pleasing to God. Sometimes we commit sins. God, sorry for doing that. Whatever the case may be. So God, sorry, I put, I put earning money above serving you. God, I did this. You know, whatever, whatever it is. We fall short. We fall way short. Jesus Christ always did those things that were pleasing unto the Father. And that's why he was just 100% full-time in the ministry of just going out and helping other people and putting everyone else before himself at all times. And his earthly ministry, that's what he did. He came to serve, not to be served. When he comes back, he's going to get all that glory and honor that he deserves. He's going to come back and he's going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. Praise God for that. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait for that. But 
when he came here the first time, he was humble, he was meek, he was a servant, and did everything right. Yes, it's important that the righteousness of Jesus gets imputed unto us. The Bible says that even when you know that you're supposed to do something good and you don't do it, that that's a sin. The Bible says in James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When you know you're supposed to be doing something, yet you refrain from doing it, you say, well, I'm not, doing, you know, I'm not actively doing something bad. Yeah, but when you stop yourself from doing something that you know you're supposed to do, that's a sin also. Jesus never did that. When Jesus knew there was something that was right to do, he did it every single time without fail. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Probably the last place I'll have you turn. There's one other reference after that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read for you from Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Because we receive the righteousness of Jesus by being in Christ. Being in Christ is, is um, a phrase that's used multiple times in the Bible, being in Him. The Bible says in Philippians 3, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. This was Apostle Paul talking about himself. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me... Those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That righteousness is the righteousness that we all need in order to enter heaven. It's the righteousness which is of faith, which is not of the law. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 17. We're almost done tonight. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17, the Bible reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if your faith is in Christ, if any man be in Christ, that's what it means to be in Christ, is that, that you're a believer, you're born again. And it's proven here, it says he is a new creature. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. There's a new spirit that's been born inside of you. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Everything has become new to you. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And again, one more place, right, that says that Jesus Christ knew no sin. He did no sin. He did not commit any sin. He was made sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God. And in this chapter, I'm going to close on this point, is that if you're in Christ, the Bible says you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Your old life, all those old things, they're passed away. All things are become new unto you. As a child of God, as a, that, that new man inside of you, all things are new. And all things are of God, it says, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ because he paid for your sins. That is how you have been reconciled with God. You know, you hear about people reconciling marriages when your marriages are going through problems and people are fighting and you want to split up and then you reconcile. What does that mean? You kind of make things right and you come back together. Well, us and God, when you sin, when you've broken his law and you become a transgressor of his law, you got a problem. Because God's angry about that and there's a judgment that, that you deserve to pay and that's a judgment of hell which has, in a sense, you know, separated you. I hate using that term separation from God because people just kind of dismiss the whole 
hell and everything else with it. But in a sense, you do have, you have a problem with God and you need to be reconciled with Him. You need that debt now that you owe from your sin, that debt punishment of hell to be paid for. You need to get that reconciled. Jesus Christ offers that way. So once you become reconciled, now you and God are on good terms again. You're in good standing because Christ paid your whole ways, paid your debt clean. Those sins are no longer be looked at. As far as the east is from the west, so far as God separated us from our sins, but now he's committed unto us that ministry of reconciliation. That is now our job to go out and tell other people how to get reconciled unto God. He says, okay, you're reconciled with me? Great, now you've got a new job. You know what your job is? Go tell everyone else how to get reconciled with me too because I want everybody to be reconciled with me. It says to it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God was in Christ when Christ was here trying to reconcile the world into him through the mouth of Jesus himself. Tell him how to be saved. Tell him to believe. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. It says, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. He said, this is what he did through Jesus. Jesus didn't walk around this earth anymore. He's not doing this anymore. But now we are those ambassadors. Christ was the spokesman for God. Christ doesn't walk around anymore. Now we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead since Christ isn't here. Now we're praying you. We're talking to you. Be ye reconciled to God. That is our job. We need to explain the righteousness that Jesus Christ has and, and all the righteousness available to you, to, to every unbeliever through faith in, in, in Christ. The way, that, the way that you receive this righteousness is, gonna, is different than, than anything else you might think of because normally when you think of being righteous, you're, you're going to be doing what's right and doing good according to the law. Well, the righteousness that we need through Christ comes only by faith. It cannot be earned or merited on our own. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great, wonderful works that Jesus did for us, dear Lord. And just to, to take a step back and to think about um, how he was tempted in all points like as we are, that he lived in the flesh, in, in a fleshly body uh, like we have today, dear God, and that he was tempted with things, but he never sinned. He never even considered them. He never even got to the point in his mind where it was going to really be an option for him. But the, 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 the feelings were there, the, the, um, the, the um, opportunities were there for him to be able to sin. God, and he didn't do any of that through his own righteousness. And we thank you for allowing us to have uh, that imputed unto us simply by putting our faith and believing you and believing your son, dear God, and in putting our faith on you that you give us not only the forgiveness of sins, but the imputation of righteousness, dear Lord. We love you. Thank you for being such a, a, a merciful, long-suffering God, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.